Welcome back to another episode of Podward State. I'm one of your hosts, Grace Cunningham. I'm Connor Krause. I'm Shannon Smith. Today we have an extra special guest host joining us, Toby Prime. Toby, how are you? Feeling good, living better. Grace, how are you? I'm pretty good. Toby and I are sharing a mic right now for those of you who are only listening, so we're passing it back and forth. It's very fun. Um, But yeah, today we have a really exciting episode. We have men's basketball head coach Micah Shrewsbury on the show. He was awesome. We already did it, but... It was really fun. What do you guys think? Yeah, he was great. I mean, for someone that holds such a big position at the school, he's so humble, and it's just awesome to see. It's really refreshing to see someone that wants to go meet people instead of waiting for people to meet him. So I thought it was really cool. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because this all started with us, what, sliding in his DMs <laughs> and all of a sudden. But it was great. I think my cheeks literally hurt because I was smiling so much yeah. during the interview. He's just such a great dude, um, and I hope you guys all enjoy the interview. And stay tuned until the end of the episode when we talk to Tim Neville, who is the executive director of Penn State's Homecoming 2022. Now we're going to get into our interview with Micah Shrewsbury. Now joining us, we have second year Penn State men's basketball coach, Micah Shrewsbury. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. I'm... uh... Excited to excited to join you guys today. Yeah, of course. It's an honor. Um, so kind of going back a little bit, you're an Indiana native, and it seems like you're a proud representation of the Hoosier State. Um, can you tell us a little about your p- playing career at Hanover College? It, um, you know, I, I, I've been, a, I've grown up like a basketball junkie, like, live, you know, in Indiana and everything else. And, um, but I was also realistic where I knew basketball is going to end for me at some point in time. Uh, so, you know, like I wanted to stay around the game. I wanted to continue to play. Um, you know, so I, I played division three basketball and I chose Hanover because of basketball. Like I, I know that sounds crazy to people like, you know, people that choose colleges for different reasons, I literally chose it because of basketball and it was, it was a very beautiful campus down there too. Um, so I enjoyed it. I had fun. I, I played four years. My freshman year, we went to NCAA tournament. Uh, you know, a kid on our team that was a senior was national player of the year that year. Um, and then, you know, three other years after that, we did, didn't make the tournament, but just great memories of um, being around those guys having some great experiences. I got some awesome stories uh, from, you know, riding the vans and the buses and everything else. So uh, college basketball was like the greatest uh, time of my life. You know, there's no bills to pay. There's no kids (laughs) to look after. You're just hooping and going to school. Um, So (laughs) obviously college basketball was all about, you loved it all. You kept with it because you went right into the coaching Uh, ranks as an assistant at Wabash could you just like what prompted you to start that professional career as a coach like would you put the game aside but you went on the coaching route yeah and like I said I wanted to be around it um I you know that was the way to do it coaching was the way that I, I could do it and um I knew like getting towards the end of my career um I needed to start figuring out how I was going to get into coaching. And you know, that's sometimes the hardest thing is like getting your foot in the door. Um, this was, it's, it's like Hanover college for some reason has become like a breeding ground for college, <clears throat> excuse me, college basketball coaches. So of the four years that I was there, um, there are, you know, maybe five to six, head high school basketball coaches. Um, the head coach at Hanover now was a teammate of mine. Uh, one of my roommates is the head coach at an NAI school in Florida. Um, one of the assistant coaches at Virginia was a Hanover guy. Like we're all over the place and it's, it's pretty cool to see. Uh, we have that network of, co- of coaches now, uh, but I, I had to use my connection. So I started, I was actually in, a graduate assistant at university of Indianapolis for one year. And I got that job because they had recruited some of my high school teammates. 
So I'd known the coach and ended up getting a job there. Um, but you know, that that's another great story. Like I'm, I worked there for a year and I, I had to like text coach Sturgeon, the head coach, he's a head high school coach now in Indiana, Southern Indiana. I texted him when I got the job, I was like, Hey coach, I apologize for how bad I was as a graduate assistant when I was there. Um, I could have been the worst GA that's ever, you know, that has ever happened to basketball. You know, it's a surprise I'm here now based on how I started my career. <laughs> so in 2005, you earned your first shot at a head coaching gig at IU South Bend as a 29-year-old. How difficult or rewarding was it to run a program on your own at such a young age? Um, I had this, like, crazy goal. And it goes back when I was leaving college. I was like, I want to be a head coach by the time I'm 30. And I didn't know how realistic that would be. Um, I didn't know what it would take or how long it would take or how challenging it would be. Um, but that summer when I got the job at um, IU South Bend, you know, I was a head coach. I was going to be 30 that summer. So I accomplished that goal. Um, but in the midst of doing that, I probably didn't realize or recognize all that would have gone into it, right? How much um, I should have investigated a little bit more. Like, I love that situation. It helped me a lot, but they weren't set up to have a lot of success then. They are now. It's gotten a lot better since I've left. And I think I had a hand in helping them change some things to make it better. Um, but it wasn't a great situation, but I reached my goal. And, and something that I wanted to do. Um, but also, I wasn't quite ready to be a head coach either. Um, I wasn't sure. I wasn't 100% sure of who I wanted to be as a coach, right? What I was doing there was mimicking some of the other coaches that I had been around. I hadn't had a chance to find my own voice. I hadn't had a chance to know how I wanted to play or how I wanted the program to run. Um, but it was great learning experience for me. And now, you know, it really helped me nowadays. Now I know. Now I feel a lot better about what what I want to do, who I want to be, and how I want to run my program. Yeah. So from there, you coached under Brad Stevens at Butler for a few years for one of the most historical underdog runs in college basketball history. Um, how sweet was the back-to-back -back Final Four and national title runs as such a counted-out program in both seasons it it um it was really fun like you don't really know what you're going through at that time you know you're just accomplishing so much as a team that you kind of get lost in the success uh, of what's happening and uh, we had so I was there for four years um we had some really good teams when I was there and the second year I was there, the guys that went to the final four the first time, a lot of those guys were freshmen. So Gordon Hayward, Shelvin Mack, uh, Ronald Norrid, uh, Matt Howard was a sophomore. We had a really good team returning. And we told those guys, like, hey, we should let, – let's make the NCAA tournament. Like, that should be our goal is to make the NCAA tournament. And we had a really good season. We got an at-large bid, the NCAA tournament, and as soon as we hit our goal, we just all, like, took a collective breath, and we got beat the very first game. <laughs> and, and it was like we we set the bar too low for that group. You know, and they hit their goal. Now there's, like, nothing else for them to, to accomplish or try to attain. So uh, we brought that entire group back the next year, and we started off a little bit rocky and – uh, we had high expectations, and we lost a bunch of games early. Um, and then we we kind of hit our stride after Christmas, and we just took off. And the you know the games were fun, the experiences were fun. Uh, but now, going back, what I love as a coach is seeing those guys now. Like it's pretty cool that um, Gordon, Shelvin, Matt Howard were all inducted into the Butler Hall of Fame last weekend. Um, it's pretty cool to see. I've had a couple of those guys talk to our team on Zoom calls, um, you know, seeing what those guys are doing now. Even the guys that weren't great players or had great roles, 
like following their careers and what they're doing now professionally, that part of it um, is pretty cool. So we actually, during the pandemic was the, let's see, it would have been the 10 year anniversary of that final four. Um, so they showed the game on CBS on, on a Sunday and we all got together on zoom and watched it together. So that was, that was a fun experience. Yeah, going off of that, how cool is it to see Butler make the jump from the Horizon League to the Big East recently? And do you guys feel responsible for you that? You know what? It, it's in a way um, a lot went into it, uh, but those guys like what they did, like how what they accomplished, um, it really changed the trajectory of that school. And like after we went to the Final Four the first time, and then the second time, like the applications in terms of, you know, for admissions just went through the roof in terms of the amount of people that now heard about Butler or wanted to go to Butler and things of that nature. Um, so it really did change. The campus has changed a lot. I don't get back, I get back there every once in a while, but um, how much it's changed is all kind of attributed to that group that did that. So that's pretty cool. That's something that like, you know, I'd love to do here and like, you know, have us yeah. be the reason that that more kids want to come here to you know to get a chance to watch Penn State basketball. Yeah. So moving forward a little bit, um, you decide to follow Coach Stevens to the NBA with the Celtics. Was that a move you expected going to the NBA ranks? And how does it differ from teaching professionals with kind of inflated egos to college it, kids? Um, I never really had a dream to go to the I NBA. I always wanted to be a college coach. Um, the NBA just happened, right? This, you know, one of my best friends ends up getting a job as the NBA head coach and I'm a loyal person. Uh, so I, I wanted to, I wanted to go with him. Like I wanted to experience it, but I wanted to go with him to like make sure that he was going to be good. Right. I knew he, he'd be a great coach cause that's what he is, but, um, to make sure that there's that little bit of comfort that's, that's there with you on the sideline uh, as you're going through different things, new experiences. So I kind of put myself on the back burner a little bit. Um, it was an unbelievable experience. Like I've learned a lot, you know, from doing that. It's, you know, 82 games in a year plus. Um, back then when we were first starting, we were playing like six to eight preseason games. Then we started going to the playoffs. We're getting to like 100, 100 games in the season which is like three college seasons in one year. So I spent six years there. That's like 18 college seasons. So the amount of knowledge that I picked up when I was there was, was unbelievable. It, it helped me so much grow as a coach. Um, dealing with players, like it's all the same, right? Like um, they're just older than the guys that we have. They're better. They're also better than the guys that we have and they're richer than the guys that we have, uh, but they want to be coached. Um, they want to understand the game. They want to like, how can you help them? And I think that's what the biggest thing is, is how can you help them? And that's, you know, the same here with, with college kids is um, go with them, go to with information that, that can help them. And now, you know, what you're trying to help them with might be different, right? It's, you know, instead of a college kid saying, I want to try and make the NBA, the NBA guys are like, I want to get to my next contract. I want to make an all-star game. Um, you know, I want to be a first team, all NBA, whatever it may be. Uh, you still have to provide some kind of service for them to help them. And if you're really genuine in that, um, and if you know your stuff, then they'll listen to you. But you got to be prepared. I learned that early on. Um, that was, you know, I had some good mentors early on in the NBA that taught me you have to really be prepared and know your stuff because these guys have been under some really good coaches and, you know, they've they've seen a lot of situations. So if, if you come to them with an idea and you don't feel strong about it or you don't have, like, here's plan B and C of why we're going to do it, and how it's going to work, then they're just going to write you off. They're like, nope, we're not doing that. So, um, you know, you got to come with ideas. You got to have good ideas. 
and then you got to be strong in your backing, you know, kind of strong and setting your feet and saying, this is what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. And if you go with that um, to them, then, then they'll buy into that stuff. Yeah, Coach, so I want to stay on the topic of uh, NBA players. So it's well documented you have strong relationships with Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Gordon Hayward, just to name a few. All those players are generational NBA All-Stars. Could you just tell us a little bit more about those players or other players that normal people outside the NBA inner circles typically don't? Yeah, that, um, you know, it's – the relationships with those guys, you know, they all came in different ways. Like, you know, I was with Gordon at Butler for two years and he was a guy that was pretty lightly recruited. Um, there were a couple of big 10 schools that recruited and Gordon, both of Gordon's parents went to Purdue. Uh, so Purdue recruited him some Michigan, uh, but he ended up wanting to stay home at Butler and to see how good he got in a short amount of time. Um, but just a lot of time spent in the gym with them. I think that's where you kind of create those relationships. Uh, so he and I spent a lot of time together in the gym in his two years at Butler, just one-on-one -on -one working on different things. And now, you know, our relationships to the point where I was recruiting in Charlotte and I went to see him early one morning and it's like, you know, we probably hadn't seen each other in a couple of years since I left Boston. And uh, it, it just picked up, right? Like, you know, it was like we were we saw each other the week before um, just because of the time we spent together, the experiences we went through. I guess because I have young kids, I was like the rookie whisperer at Boston. So um, when we drafted Jalen, I, I started working with Jalen. And, you know, they I guess they thought I did a good job. So they, you know, gave me Tatum the next year as well. And I had both of those guys. But – just trying to help them through all experiences because um, the NBA is so new. It's so difficult to figure out whether it's um, your time management, whether it's your money management, uh, whether, you know, what you got to do to get on the court and play um, all those things. And those guys were 19 years old doing it. And, you know, it's so different. Uh, so just trying to help those guys in any way. And, you know, the NBA is turned to, especially when we were in a unique position, we were good. So we were a playoff team, but we were also young where we were trying to develop our guys at the same rate. Uh, so I would spend time in the summers, like going to St. Louis and spending time with Jason Tatum, uh, working out with him and doing different things, going to Atlanta, spending time with Jalen Brown as he's working out and, you know, that that's the biggest thing is you build those relationships just by the time you spend with them. And, you know, it's nothing, nothing over the top. A lot of people are doing it, but um, they feel like you're invested in them. And that's um, something I try and carry over here to our guys. Like, you know, you just want to invest time in people and make them feel um, like what they're doing is the most important thing to you. And it is. It's the most important thing to them. So when I go down there, it's the most important thing to me as well. And I think that's where you see the kind of genuineness. Like that's that's why Jalen Brown will come back or come to Penn State. He has no ties to Penn State besides myself. And um, one of our graduate assistants is his cousin. Like that's his only ties to Penn State. He's never been here. He actually got on the mic and um, one of our cheerleaders was mic'd up and came over and talked to him and Jalen said go Wildcats at the end like he he doesn't know anything about Penn State but he felt like he wanted to try and help me um, and help our program so to come and spend time with our players come and experience what we're doing just because I did that for him uh, that's kind of you know where our relationship is yeah. So after landing back in Indiana as an assistant at Purdue, you decide to take the Penn State head coaching job for your first Division One lead position. So what kind of drew you to Penn State um, and Happy Valley um, to take a historically tough job where success hasn't always come? You know, easy? I, um, I don't know. Maybe I guess it's there's a little bit of 
I don't know if it's humility. Um, I might get this quote wrong, but I look it up. I look up these quotes all the time. People, uh, one of them was about humility and it was, um, humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less, right? I took the job at Purdue and coach painter is an unbelievable coach, like, a great mentor to me, a great friend to me. Um, But I took the job there and he knew it and he helped me like, because I was going to, it was going to help me become a head coach. But I never thought that I would be able to get a job in the big 10. Like, yeah, maybe go to, uh, I'm going to have to go somewhere else (laughs) and then maybe get a job in the big 10. Like I didn't think I'd be able to get it from Purdue. And maybe that's, you know, me thinking less of myself, um, that I didn't think that was attainable, but, um, I've grown up like a huge big 10 fan, like my whole life. That's that's all I've watched is big 10 basketball. So, um, you know, when I got an opportunity to start talking to the people here and start interviewing here, I was like, if this is going to be realistic, like this is, this is a hundred percent done. Like I'm doing this. Um, I don't like, I don't really care about other people's expectations. Um, yeah, I guess I'm different in that way, but like I, I see, and I say this all the time when I'm recruiting. So like Penn state has had success in basketball, um, but they've done it kind of here and there. Right. They've had a good year and then not a good year. Then, you know, a few years low and then they come back and have a really good year. Um, so it's about sustaining success. I think that's the biggest thing that, that we're trying to do here. Um, and you do it in a couple of different ways, you know, whether that's through recruiting, whether that's through player development, whether that's through staff retention, um, whatever it may be. Um, but like I look around and – like there's a lot of other sports, you know, we got 31 sports here and a lot of those teams are having success, right? Like we, you know, our football team's always very relevant in terms of the success they've had. Women's volleyball's never missed an NCAA tournament since it started. Um, you know, we've, we won a national championship and a bunch of big 10 championships in women's soccer, men's soccer team will be ranked. Um, wrestling is dominated here. Um, for the past decade so you look at like the success of all these other sports so you're saying it can be done here right like other people are doing it so it can be done if i looked around and there are 31 sports and all 31 were losing no chance you guys be interviewing me right now because i would not be here uh, i'd be somewhere else but you can have success here right and i saw that through those other programs now we have to do it in our own way And um, I think we've started it in that way in terms of laying the foundation of how we want to play. Um, But now also stacking recruiting classes together one after another where you're getting the talent where you need it um, and things like that. And then, you know, I'm fired up about the energy that we have with, um, you know, a new president, a new AD, uh, just at the same coming in at the same time. Um, as, as kind of that, how I'm coming in and when I'm coming in. So it's just an exciting time and uh, I'm fired up to see like what's next, what we can do. Uh, you know, so it's a good place. I, I, it fits me. I'm a college town kind of guy. I hate traffic. I lived in Boston six years. I hate like looking at my GPS and it's like, Hey, you got four miles to go. And it's like, an hour and a half. I'm like, no chance. Do I ever want to do that in my life? Like, I love getting in my car and getting to work in five minutes. You know, doesn't matter what time of day it is. That part, like, you know, people don't think about that uh, when they think about different jobs. That part is huge for me. Um, you know, I love the family feel of this town. Uh, I love, like, the small town feel. I also like having my kids be around, you um, a bunch of different things that can happen on campus, right? Like 
I got boys that love basketball. They're, you know, basketball junkies, but I also have two girls and like, I want them to be able to experience things on campus as well. So whether it's just going to the farmer's market down, downtown, whether it's walking through at homecoming and, and seeing different things or, um, you know, just anything on campus, we, they go to musical theater events and, and all of that. Like, I want them to have role models, right? Not just my my boys watching basketball and, and watching our team and watching NBA players. Like, I want my daughters to have role models. And what better place to have it than on a college campus, people, like, trying to excel in terms of what they're doing. So we had Anna Camden on our show last semester, and she told us a story about how you were on her podcast and she recorded with you and then it didn't record. So then you re-recorded. So how important is it for you to build relationships, not only with your players, but also with other student athletes, other student athletes and students? in general? That part, like um, I'm a people person, like I, I love talking to people. So like sometimes when, you know, I say stuff or I tweet stuff or, you know, Instagram, whatever it may be, like, I'm 100% genuine in that. <laughs> like, I, I told people at uh, Be Apart from the Start, like, hey, if you guys have something going on, right? Because I'm asking, I'm asking people to come to our games. So like, you know, one of my friends says something all the time, like, bring something to the relationship. What are you going to do for me? Like, so I tell them all the time, how can I help you? Um, so I've had people reach out to me. I've had people send me Instagram messages or tweets and say, Hey coach, I have this thing coming up. Can you help me like get word out? Yeah, hundred percent. I'll do it. Like, um, you know, if I can come, I'll show up. Um, I just like meeting people. I just like talking to people. Like, you know, I also have a job, so I can't, you know, I can't go to everybody's event, but also like that part to me is, is, what it should be like. Um, I have like unbelievable coaches that are here that I can lean on and talk to and get advice from about, you know, what, you know, kind of what I can do, you know, to help our team become better, right? Like going and talking to Kale or Erica Dombach, Shar, like people like that, it, it's unbelievable. Um, but having a relationship with the students is, is big as well. Like, I want to know, like, you guys are going through a lot. I I was a college, you know, student at one point in time. I might not have been a good student, but I was a college student. Um, But like, I know what you guys are going through and everybody's busy and this is a different time. Um, But, you know, if I can help you, I'm going to help you. Um, And like, but it's got to feel genuine, right? Like, it's got to feel genuine. I'm not going to do it just so you'll come to a game, right? I'm going to do it out of the goodness of my heart just because that's who I am as a person. Um, but it, it goes back like we played one of those final four teams at Butler. And um, I remember them talking to a student at one point in time afterwards. And they were saying, and Butler's a lot smaller school. Um, but they were talking about our team and, and some of the students were like, well, we go to the games and we want these guys to do so well because it doesn't feel like I'm cheering for the team. I'm cheering for my friends. And like, that's all I'm trying to get to. Like, come cheer for your friends. So I'm, I'm trying to like get our guys involved, but I'm going to be involved, uh, you know, as much as I can be because I want you to like, Man, I really like that guy. I'm going to go support what he's doing, you know, because I'm going to come support what you're doing too. And, you know, this can be beneficial for both of us to um, really try and attain what we're trying to do. So, you know, if I can get people to come to the game, I think they'll have a good time. I I think they'll enjoy it. And, uh, you know, if they don't, I I try my best. (laughs) I'll still support you if you don't come to the games. It's cool with me. Um, you know, you got stuff going on, but I'd love for you to come. Uh, but you know, do it because like, I'm, I'm not pressuring anybody like do it because you want to, uh, come because you think it's a good time and come because you, you know, maybe you like me, maybe like my, me flipping my personality from being a really nice guy for, (laughs) 
22 hours of the day and then I turn into the Tasmanian devil for two hours. Maybe you just want to come see that. <laughs> yeah, I know before we started the episode, I was telling everyone that yesterday I was having like an awful day and I was walking by like near the IM building and you were driving by on the golf cart, like honking at some kids sitting by the we are sign. And I looked up and saw that it was you and knew we had this schedule today. And I was like, that just made my day. Like, he's he's awesome. And um, it definitely made me excited for the interview. So you saying that I, you know, I see you around on campus and everything. So yeah, that's definitely like, important. I, and I do. Like, I really mean it. Like, stop and say hi. Really like, if anybody's walking by, like, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't, I'm not important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, like some people will be like, Hey, I, you know, should we talk to this guy that like, I'm not the, I'm not the president. Like I don't have security around me. Like, like come over and say hi. Like I generally like enjoy talking to people and like, you have to say your name. I'm awful. I'm awful with names. I remember faces. I'm awful with names. So I have to like, you got to give me your name a couple of times before I can remember it. But like, and, and you know, that's just me. Like I'm just I'm old. I forget stuff. I can remember random things, but other things that I need help with. Uh, but like I I do. Like I introduce myself. I ask where you're from. How you doing today? Like you know, sometimes people just need that, right? Like everybody goes through different stuff. You never know what anybody's going through. Sometimes they just need somebody to generally ask them how they're doing. They might not give you the real answer of how they're doing, but they at least like they feel like somebody cares. And um, that's all I want, man. That's all I'm trying to do. I hope people care about me at some point in time. But, you know, if I can listen and be a, a small ear, a small boost to somebody's life for that small moment, like that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's awesome. Um Kind of going off that, last season you guys gutted out a bunch of games, winning by small margins and putting up just over 60 points per game. Uh, and you kind of coined the phrase, gritty, not pretty. So how did that come about? And how cool is that to see the social media team gain traction of that? And now students all across campus love that saying and have shirts with it. So will, will we see more of that this season and, and stuff like that? Definitely more of that this year. We got, man, I got wristbands that, <laughs> Good to hear. that say gritty, not pretty. Ooh. Oh, that, yeah, is awesome. that is awesome. Penn State branding on here on the side. Like it, you know what? It, it kind of fits me. It kind of fits like who I am. It kind of takes on our personality a little bit. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be a little bit different um, in terms of how we play this year, in terms of, you know, how we're able to score the ball. We have more depth so we can play a little bit faster, but we're never going to get away from that. Like that's who you have to be to win. And that's who you have to be to have success. So, um, you know, we'll win in any way possible. So if you want to play fast and you want to fly around, then we can do that. If you want to just slow the game down and play in the mud, then we'll do that too. Uh, we're just trying to get it done in any way possible. So I think our guys have really bought into it. You know, John was a great um, representative of that. You know, he – he lost a tooth at one point in time and like outside the media, he's like showing it to me. He's like gritty, not pretty coach. Like he was, he was the perfect compliment, you know, for my first year here. Um, but you know, a bunch of other guys kind of bought into it because they saw the, the success that we could have. Um, you know, we played so many close games. We gave ourselves a chance every single night because of the attitude that we played with, how hard we played, how gritty we played, how tough we were, um, those kind of things. So, you know, we have to continue to be that. And I think we always will be. Um, so, I, you know, hopefully we score a lot more. Man, 60 points is, you know, pulling my hair out a little bit that I got left. Uh, but, you know, that attitude – the toughness, um, you know, the the mantra of gritty, not pretty, like that's who Penn State, that's who we're going to be. And, um, you know, I, I like it. That's me. Gritty, not pretty. My wife will even tell you about his ugly. <laughs> so you've said before that when you retire, you want to get an RV and just travel around to different cities to watch football. Is there a particular city or stadium that you haven't been to? Oh, man, there's a lot. Um I'm a big college football fan. Like, I don't really watch the NFL. Like I don't, 
I spend my Sundays, you know, working, watching college basketball or film or everything else. But Saturdays, I'll watch whoever's on, you know, and, and uh, it's pretty cool that I get a chance to be here and, and like go to Beaver Stadium and watch games in there. Um, and now I want to try and hit some others that I haven't been to. Uh, it's I'm, I'm big on the environment and seeing it. So that's, you know, Coach Stevens and I talked about that, of just like getting an RV and let's go wherever college game day is that week. And let's just go to the game, tailgate, um, and just hang out. And, you know, he's a lot closer than that than I am. But, uh, you know, eventually one day I'll be able to do it too. Uh, so I don't know if there's any particular place, but I've – been to a lot my family they hate me like vacation anytime we go through a college I see a college anytime we drive by like we have to stop we have to go especially if I haven't been so you know we just stop and there's some some way somehow I can find my way in like whether I knock on the door or pull on the door or I call somebody ahead that I might have some kind of connection to we stop all the time so um I got a chance to do it. You know, we were at Duke in North Carolina a few years ago. Um, I actually did it the year before, uh, maybe a couple of years before, two years before I got the job here. And I was driving through. We used to go from Indiana, driving back to Boston. We'd go through New York all the time. And I wanted to just change the drive. So I went through Pennsylvania and I was like, oh, sign for Penn State. So I made a couple of phone calls and ended up, getting a tour of Beaver Stadium and, and the football facility over at Lash and everything else. You now, little did I know, you know, two and a half years later, I'd be the head coach here. It's crazy. Yeah, so, Coach, I just want to know what you do in your free time. I know the season's approaching quickly, so your free time might be squished, but, like, are you binging Dahmer right now, or is it kind of just all basketball for you? It's um I wish. I do I do watch um so when I travel for recruiting, that's when I get a lot of shows in. Um so the summers are the heavy, the heavy seasons. So I watch a lot of stuff during that time. Um now I'm getting more into the season, so I don't watch much. And then after we practice, I don't get home like you know, I stay and watch film and then, you know, I I still have younger kids. My daughter's fourth grade, my youngest. So like getting her to bed and they're like doing things at the house. I don't get to watch as much, but like when there's downtime, I am a, I'm a huge reality TV fan, (laughs) huge reality TV fan. So um, one of my favorite shows and like, I've seen, I don't know. I've, I've, I don't know how many seasons there are. I've seen about all of them. This is the challenge. I love the challenge on uh, MTV. And there's one on, they've moved it over to CBS now. I haven't started watching that one yet, but I watch those like not, it's like religious. Uh, <laughs> I watch those. Um, the Office, you know, that, that's a favorite of mine. I watch all, I've seen probably every episode and I rewatch them every night, even if I don't. I'm not watching it. I'll just turn it on to the channel and have it on and I'll be doing something else. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I get into a lot of those. There's uh, one of my, one of the guys on staff told me that um, Peacock, I started, I started getting on the Peacock app. They have wrestling. Um, you can watch any of the old WrestleManias, um, things of that. So there's a show that I've been watching is, um, uh, now I forget what it's called. It's an old, it's like three years old, but it was like 20 episodes and they're talking about the raw versus, uh, Monday night nitro when they came on at the same time. So I've seen probably 18 out of 20 episodes of that. So I don't know. I watch weird stuff. I guess <laughs> <laughs> the challenge is my favorite though. I do love the challenge. Um, so this is a question that we ask um, all our guests. So do you have one piece of advice for college students? Yeah, and, and I give this advice out all the time. 
So I, I talked to I talked to our players about it. Talked to other people on campus. Um, you know, I talked about you know myself. Like I'm I'm a loyal person, right? And no matter what happens when our guys are here, good, bad, whatever, like they're they're locked in with me for life. They got me forever, right? No matter how the relationship goes, like I'm gonna try and help them. Um, but I'm only one person. <laughs> so my huge piece of advice is build allies across campus. Um, so whether that is the people in your major, uh, whether that is people that in your dorm, fraternity, sorority, whatever it may be, like build other allies around campus and get out to meet other people. Uh, because the more people that can vouch for you and have your back is going to be helpful. Um, you know, I can do a lot and I can help them, but I'm, like I said, I'm only one person. Now, if you got three to four people that are vouching for you, there's just more doors that can open up for you when you need them. Um, so just getting outside of like what your normal comfort zone is and stepping into some other area and just trying to get people there that can vouch for you, um, that, you know, take an interest in you and can help you. Um, it's going to pay huge dividends when, you know, long after your time here is over um, and they'll probably continue to pay huge dividends. So that's the, that's the best piece of advice I got build allies across campus um, and use this network for how it can help you in a lot of different ways. To wrap it up, we have every guest pick an intro and outro song for the episode. So do you have any songs in mind that you'd like to pick to bring you in? Wow. That's, um, so this is, this is going way back. <laughs> I don't even know who sings it, but I used to always like, um, I'd always come back to Hanover. This is, this, uh, this is great. This is so 1995. <laughs> I, I'd always, when I came back to campus, I'd always play return of the Mac. As I oh. turned, as I pulled on the campus, I turned it on. <laughs> it was my my uh, theme music, but that was like I said, that was like 1995. I don't even know who sings that anymore. Uh, I'm a huge, I'm a huge um, Tupac guy, Outcast, Biggie, like anything night. Like I said, 90s rap, Dr. Dre, Snoop. Like that's me. Like <laughs> I don't have any like particular song, but nineties rap music is like that's my go to. That's my go to all awesome. the time. Yeah. I heard a Tupac song this morning when I was coming in. It was like I mean, I was floored. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was like, There we go. It's gonna be a good day today. <laughs> yeah. So coach, that's all we have for you, but thank you so much for joining us. This was a great conversation. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Of course. Enjoy. Joining us now, we have Penn State Homecoming's 2022 Executive Director, Tim Neville, joining us. Tim, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing today? Doing pretty well. Excited to have you. you. So this year's homecoming is set for October 16th through 22nd with the homecoming game taking place on October 22nd against Minnesota. So jumping right into the first question, this year's theme is one community forever a home. What does this mean to you? So when we were coming up with our theme, we really wanted something that resonated with what it means to be a Penn Stater. Um, we talked a lot about like what it truly means for us as members of the organization, but what we also want homecoming to mean to our community at Penn State. Um, homecoming really has this incredible part where we get to pull all of the Penn State family together and celebrate the things that they're proud of, but also share their stories and what makes them Penn Staters. Um, we also get to engage with the community through some of our events, and we really like to bring that all together. We really like to celebrate what Penn State means to people and kind of bring alumni back. It's, it's this really cool event where we get to kind of combine the Penn State energy into one whole week, and we get to celebrate it, and we get to talk about what it means to people. Very cool. 
So the homecoming parade is set for Friday, October 21st. Are you excited for that? And what are you most excited for? Yeah, I'm definitely excited for the parade. I think the the parade, kind of like I was hinting at earlier, really is this awesome part of homecoming week. It's this point where we really merge the two communities. We merge downtown State College and we merge the, the University Park campus. And we get to kind of combine all of that into one night. We get to celebrate the organizations that are on campus. We get to celebrate the organizations that within that are within town. And we get to kind of showcase all of that to the community and to alumni who come back to celebrate Penn State. That's one thing that's so special to me is that so many alumni come back for this one weekend a year. And it's that idea, um, we hint to it in our theme with Forever a Home, that like Penn State is forever a home. Once you once you come to Penn State and you fall in love with it, it truly becomes something that is so special and such an important part of your life. Cool. So what else can we expect for this homecoming week? And is there anything <clears throat> new going on that's different from last year? So we're really excited. Um, we've got an incredible week slate of events. So we start off on Monday with the Allen Street Jam. It's a block party on Allen Street. We close down the entire street in the in the heart of downtown State College. And we have music performances and con candy and all that fun stuff, as well as community engagement partners. Um, and there's free food and all that fun stuff for students. And then Tuesday, we have our event called Past to President. And Past to President is an incredible opportunity where students can kind of learn some of those tradi- traditions and history of Penn State and really what the university is founded in as a land grant institution and what it really means. Um, and then on Wednesday, we have the Best of Penn State Carnival on Hub Lawn. So it's a little bit more centered on campus where students can come out and we have some inflatable rides and some other activities that they can kind of do. And then we have ice cream and a bunch of stuff there. Thursday, we have um, a new event this year that we're partnering with the Student uh, Programming Association for an event on Thursday evening. And then we're also partnering with the PRCC for their annual pep rally um, Thursday evening as well that we're super excited for both of those events. And then on Friday night, we have the parade, obviously. We finish off the week with a bang and kind of have that celebration at the end of the week. And then sprinkled throughout, um, we have our For the Glory talent show, which is an awesome opportunity to showcase some of the different performing groups on campus and then the dance competition that uh, celebrates our dancing organizations on campus as well. Very cool. Very fun. Um, So how long have you been preparing for homecoming? So homecoming... Um, starts almost right after homecoming week ends. The week after homecoming ends, we pick our executive director, and then we start off with our executive committee and then pick our captains later on throughout the year. Um, and really, it's a, it is a full year process to plan homecoming. A lot of the initial steps are, are dealing with the permitting and dealing with contracts and then really getting into the nitty gritty of like what makes it enjoyable. But um, I'm really fortunate to have an incredible executive committee that, that pours their heart into our organization and pours their heart into Penn State. So, so whole year. what are you most excited for personally for homecoming week? I think that's a hard question. I, I've kind of racked my brain the last few weeks as to like what my favorite part of homecoming is. And, and I think that I, I'm a sucker for Allen Street Jam. I really am. I think that it has such a unique part of, of drawing the Penn State community together. And it's this really cool way that we, we engage with the downtown community and we engage with the state college community. Um, and it's also a great way that we engage with the student body and kind of show them some of the resources that are available to them. So I'm definitely excited for Allen Street Gym the most, I think. Nice. So is there anything else you want our listeners to know about Homecoming Week? Um, I really just want to encourage everybody to come out to the to the events. They are all free. Um, you you pay for them with your student fees. So like come out to them, come engage with them. Like we want you to spend some time with us. We want you to spend some time with your peers at the university, meet some new people and really just have a good time. That's what they're here for. Um, I think that that would be my biggest thing is just come out and have a good time. Awesome. I'm excited. I live um, above Solly Boys on Allen Street. Oh, yeah. So it's always fun during the Allen Street Jam to like walk, walk, walk out and everything's like everyone's having fun. It's popping. Oh, yeah. I can hear the music in my apartment. It's good vibes. <laughs> Got to come down. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us. We're definitely excited for homecoming week. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure our listeners are also. Thank you, guys. Yeah, of course. That was another episode of Podward State. Mikey Shrewsbury joined us today. What did you guys think? I thought he was awesome. He was so bubbly and fun. Toby said it in the beginning, but we were just like smiling the whole time. He made us laugh. Yeah. Not much more you can ask I for with a, the with a guest. Yeah, he had a lot of good stories. Yeah, really good. Yeah, I'd love to road trip with him sometime. I just want to like give him a hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was another episode of Podward State. I'm Grace Cunningham. I'm Connor Krause. I'm Shannon Smith. And I'm Toby Prime. See you guys next week. See ya. Your lie to me She said she'd never turn on me Your lie